welcome to ABA Inside Track Special Babbitt 2017 Edition. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz. I'm here in lovely Amherst, Massachusetts. Or technically, we're staying outside of Amherst, Massachusetts because we saved a lot of money on our hotel. And I'm joined with... Hey, it's Diana. Hey, Diana. How are you? I'm good. How are you? This is a spacious, a spacious room that we're recording in <laughs> right now. And unfortunately, Jackie cannot be here because she had brought her baby with her. And so she needs some mom baby time. We slept our kids off to uh, babe to my mom's <laughs> for the night. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about that anymore. So we're here uh, after the first day of Babbitt. And we have had a fun experience. Uh, we, we've had a number of people mention that they've listen to the podcast and they like the podcast, which was just very, very nice. So if you did so, thank you very much because nothing makes our day more than having someone be like, oh my God, I listened to that. Even yeah, if that's, that's the cool. end of the sentence. Yeah. yeah. Thanks y'all. So uh, we had one day so far of the conference, two days if people went to workshops, but we were not able to. So we've just been, been at talks all day. And despite what you may think, Diana and I actually, even though we're married, don't just go to the same talks and sit next to each other and hold hands. You know, we, we go to, <laughs> we go to different talks. So, Diana, what, what would you say has been, what was sort of the, the, the tone of the conference this year? Did it feel like it was just busier? It was, the topics were around one area? And kind of what's, what's your sense of the conference overall? Well, I think that any conference that's not a single track conference is really going to be what you make of it. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about Babbitt, year after year, is they always have such a high level of high quality. Talk some really big uh researchers and names in the field and not just locally they pull from people who are all over the country and i really appreciate that so it really depends on you know what you're interested in i think that i tend to gravitate towards talks that are going to be a little bit different than what i've heard in the past so i don't attend that many talks that are necessarily uh, autism related or mm -hmm. training related because i have heard a lot of those already so I'm, I'm often looking for some different types of things or a chance to hear people speak who I might not have an opportunity to hear otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it was consistent for me with past Babbitt experiences. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that it was, a I thought, an excellent day. Yeah. I thought Jim Carr's keynote address and his talk on the diversity, diversity of behavior analysis mm -hmm. was was very good. It was a great way to kick off the conference. And maybe, like you said, maybe it was just I chose to pick things that were not what I would typically go to, which is a lot of work on um, working with children with autism, or working on challenging behavior, that I felt like there were a lot of options if you wanted to learn about something that you hadn't ever really focused on before. So certainly a lot on performance management, mm -hmm. some talks on medication, there was some mental health this year, which I'm sure there have been in the past. I just I can't remember too many of them. I think Dr. Gopian did a talk on anxiety at one point last year, but it, it just felt like there were so many options. If you did not want to just learn about, you know, kind of the, the the bread and butter of what you'd see at a conference for behavior analysis, you didn't want to just learn about discrete trial training or basic reinforce, you know, discussion about reinforcers. There was so much more. Although, do conditioned reinforcers exist uh, as one of the talks? I know I saw that mentioned in a lot of other talks. Yeah, I didn't get to see Jason's talk. On I didn't either. Conditioned reinforcers exist, but it was a hot topic. I yeah. Know that, and I, I don't know enough about what was said to, to comment one way or another, but yeah. it seemed like it was interesting. So maybe that'll be making the rounds at later conferences. I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah. So what was what was the hot what was the hot topic that you went to? You know, I think I mean you mentioned Jim Carr's talk and I think that I really like that one. It could be because it was the opening talk. And full disclosure, Rob and I hardly ever make it to the opening talk <laughs> <laughs> on Thursday because we were dropping our kids off and getting everything situated and then driving to Amherst. Uh, so maybe it was just because it was so special that we managed to get there before we one, one minute to spare to get CEs right, too, yeah, which was we nice. Like ran in. <laughs> um, and yeah, so you know, Jim Carr's talk was talking about diversity in behavior analysis and he made some interesting points, and his one of his uh, his beef, I guess, was with uh, other talks that I think his concern was that while we should be expanding our field, we shouldn't be belittling the work that 
people are doing mm -hmm. with children with developmental disabilities because that is really important work. So sometimes you'll come away from those conferences feeling like, oh, I work with kids with autism and that's how I ended up in behavior analysis and maybe that I should have expanded and looked at other mm -hmm. things. But, you know, truthfully, a lot of us ended up in this field because we were interested in working with children with special needs mm -hmm. and we shouldn't feel bad about that. If that's where your heart's at, then you found a, a good like-minded community here that's doing a lot of really good work. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of his uh, points was we shouldn't, while it is important that we expand our field, we shouldn't make anyone feel bad if they like to work with children mm -hmm. with autism. Um, also, that it's not, it's not easy. It's not like, you know what, you're right, I've been inspired. I'm going to work with the elderly or I'm going to work in right. animal training. It's not like you can just... If you know you're you're you've been in your career, you've been doing this for for ten years, suddenly be like, well, I know the basic principles, so I can work on anything, and mm -hmm. it's not that simple. You can't just suddenly switch gears completely, quit your job, and go find someone who can mentor you and get you started in a new field. I mean, you can, but right. it, it's not not reasonable to expect that by just exhortation alone, we can get more people into different fields. It's not it's not so straightforward. Right, and that was his. That talk was sort of a, let's take a step back and analyze our field as a whole. How do we end up here with autism as our main focus? And that's because that's, you know, the research that's been done has been done in that area and has sort of continued to perpetuate itself uh, into that field. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that behavior analysis works for. Mm -hmm. It just happened uh, that that sort of took off in conjunction with, like, Let Me Hear Your Voice by Catherine Maurice the LOVAS study, and then the creation of Autism Speaks sort of all had an influence in mm -hmm. creating ABA and Autism as these lifelong partners that they are currently. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no reason to think that we couldn't make those types of gains in other areas. It just hasn't happened yet. And that was you know, part of what he was trying to say too, is if you have interest in other areas, seek out someone who can assist you. Uh, so f from the ground up, he was talking about it from that perspective, like most of us have gotten into the field through our work versus through our schooling, in fact. So if you have other areas of interest, then, you know, you, you as an agent can work to, to search out someone who can assist you in, in developing that into a career. But the other way we should be thinking about it is from the top down. So if our graduate programs are centered around autism treatment, then there's nothing wrong with that, but we're not necessarily creating additional avenues for study and research that are going to then contribute to creating new lines of employment for behavior analysts. Mm. So he was really looking at it, I think, from both sides. And that was a good perspective for me yeah. to take. And I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in those areas. I mean, you can You can specialize in behavioral gerontology, but if there aren't jobs out there afterwards, then likely you're going to go work with kids with autism to, in mm -hmm. order to use your degree. So uh, we as a field need to be conscious of how we're, uh, what attempts are we making to make inroads into other areas and assist new behavior analysts as, as, they, as they come along, if they do have other areas of interest, in order to make those potentially uh, lucrative mm -hmm. jobs. Yeah. That's all i got to say about that. Oh, okay. You don't ask me what I like. It's, oh, Rob, what did you like? Oh, no, they might, who, it's, it's not important. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Who cares, right? Uh, so I, I think I saw a lot of talks I really liked. You know, you, usually you go and there'll be one or two that you really like and then a few that you're like, oh, that was all right. You know, but for the most part, I think I left so many of my talks just really excited. Uh, but in terms of talks that I really liked, so certainly uh, Florence DeGenero Reed talked about staff performance, which you know, if anyone who listened to our supervision series in September knows is fresh on our mind. So it was nice to get some more information about feedback or how to give feedback or tools to, you know, supervision tools. But I think probably my favorite talk was by Douglas Woods, who works in, is a clinical psychologist and works uh, with patients with Tourette's syndrome. And it wasn't a great talk just because it did the, here's how to solve Tourette's. Here's how to solve this problem. Because honestly, you know, if you read any of the research on Tourette's syndrome from, I think, the, like the 90s, you know, it, it did read like, oh, okay, there's there's a solution for this now. But the real crux of the talk was, how did, how did he go from being 
a student of behavior analysis who knew how to solve the problem of Tourette syndrome to getting people in the neuro, you know, the neuro neurological community or the psychiatric community or the psycho psychological community to actually believe believe the research. Right. Mm -hmm. And he did have a couple points, and I wanted to kind of share them real quick with you. I'm not going to go into into detail because if you get a chance to see this talk, it's it's great. It's just a really excellent description of how they solved that problem, and and I think similar to how. Uh, Jim Carr had been talking about, you know, how do we how do we disseminate? How do we get in these other fields? And it's certainly, you know, Dr. Wood started with engaging other disciplines. So who are other people who are stakeholders talking to them about this? Talking about how to solve these problems in their language, not our own language. So understanding that we can't just use our terminology and expect everyone to come to us because we solved it. Because guess what? Nobody cares if we solved a problem if we don't make it understandable even to other professionals, they really don't care. If it's like, look at these papers. We've solved this problem. We have a treatment that always works. Nobody cares. Uh, use their designs when appropriate was one. So certainly he, he explained how he did research so that he could get it published in journals that were not just Java over and over again. And one of it was he had to do group design. And we don't usually do a lot of group design. We're single subject studies most of the time, but he put it in a group design. And as he said, this wasn't a test for me to demonstrate that this is an effective treatment. I already know it's an effective treatment. This was a test to demonstrate to other people right. that it was an effective treatment. Because if you have a big N, people will believe you. If you're like, look at these multiple single subject designs, eh, but you didn't do a group design is usually what you're going to hear. Uh, also, taking concerns of stakeholders seriously. So he went through a lot of talk about how a lot of people said, well, uh, if you stop people's ticks, they're going to have anxiety over it. So, okay, how could you how could you produce a study in which you demonstrate that changing the rate of ticking doesn't add extra anxiety? Because that's a, I, the rebound effect was another big one. How can I demonstrate that this doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. And, you know, finally, engaging advocacy groups. Because I think the other positive was that there were a lot of groups who just decided all you have for us is medication. It doesn't work. So there were groups that wanted a better solution. So he was able to work with those groups and make it known, like, look, there are other solutions. And as he said, a good advocacy group is going to tell a lot more people about your work than you will ever Absolutely. be able to do. Cool. Uh, so it was just, it was just really excellent. Like just, a, it felt like a play-by-play -play review of, hey, do you want people to take you seriously in other disciplines? Here's how. And I don't know if it'll always be as straightforward because I know a lot of the research around Tourette syndrome and treatment for it, they were able to come up with very you know, useful treatments, so habit reversal treatments that were very effective. Mm -hmm. I know that in some fields, especially mental health, you might not always get that level of success quite the same way. And if you were working, say, anxiety or depression, perhaps it's not as straightforward. Though maybe those aren't good examples because I think the treatments for those are actually pretty, pretty well researched at this point as well. There's always room for more research. But uh, it was just really, really fabulous to kind of get that, get that talk and that explanation. So it wasn't just here's how to do a thing so much as here's the story of the how to do a thing. Nice. Yeah. Well, those are those are my that was probably my, my biggest one. But like I said, a lot of great talks. So kind of to end the episode, last year, we were able to talk to a couple people at one of this sort of after hours events. But this year, given Jackie's schedule, we weren't all able to get together at the same time. So we decided that we would check out the Babbitt poster session where students and sometimes their professors are demonstrating some of the research they've been working on. It's like part of a part of thesis, just master's thesis, maybe maybe dissertation. Sometimes I didn't yeah. always ask. And so we went and we talked to about six people and we, everyone was very gracious with their time because if we're talking to them, other people see the microphone and they were like, oh, I shouldn't ask any questions, which is good. Don't ask questions. I have a microphone, a very important person, right? And yeah, so we have uh, six, six researchers who shared their work with us very briefly. And so we're going to play those brief interviews for you. Now, it, it is a little, you might have to turn your volume up because it was a very crowded and loud it room. Was. As I told everyone before I interviewed them, I might not use these because I have no idea what this sounds like and we may not be able to hear you. But they actually, I think, came out pretty well. But again, it, you, know, you probably have to listen up pretty closely just to, to make it all out because it was a very noisy room. All right, so here we go with some Babbitt poster presentation floor interviews. I won't call it floor time because that's, no. No. All right, here we go. So we're here at the Babbitt poster session. I'm talking with is Mika, Mika Kuhn. 
about methodology for testing whether tokens function as reinforcers. So Mika, tell me a little bit more about, about your study. All right, so this study is looking at, as you said, whether or not tokens actually function as reinforcers, whether or not they're responsible for um, behavior occurring. Um, so what we're looking at is, say you have an FR1 production schedule and an FR5 exchange schedule, and we're looking to, we will, uh, responses will produce a token for four responses, and there'll be a one minute pause, and then the fifth token will be uh, delivered contingent on a different response, and then the exchange occurs for the back of reinforcer. The comparison is to a tandem condition, which is exactly the same as the token condition, except for the tokens are not being delivered, contingent are responding, and that comparison allows us to see whether or not the tokens themselves are responsible for the increase in responding, or if it is just the temporal contiguity to the primary reinforcer. Okay, and, and what were your results? How did it come out? For some uh, individuals, they do function as reinforcers, and for some, they do not. Okay. Which requires like further establishment of the tokens themselves. Oh. So, is this something that that you see, or, or your your lab was sort of looking as this would be something that could be done? This would be a procedure to be replicated and used, say, in like a, a classroom setting, or? Yeah, we would uh, recommend that if you are using condition reinforcers for clients that if they're not functioning the way that you would want them to, that you do uh, this comparison and then you can uh, do another preparation that can establish them as condition reinforcers. Okay. Well, Mika, thank you so much for explaining that. For thank us. you. I appreciate <laughs> it. All right, so I'm here talking to Jessica Sanses about her work on teaching an adult with autism spectrum disorder using an activity schedule during, and this is what drew me to the poster, a vocational beekeeping task. Yes, um, exactly. So I work at Drexel University and we collaborate with a supported employment agency. Um, and they told us about a consumer that they have who has a really intense interest um, in bees and in insects. So they carved a uh, job in an apiary as a beekeeper for him. That's um, excellent. Yeah, which is really exciting and really cool. Um, but they did notice that he wasn't really achieving fluency with the tasks. Um, he was relying a lot on job coach prompting to move throughout the tasks. Um, so the job coach really wasn't able to fade his presence, and the participant wasn't really um, you know, gaining independence with, with his job. Uh, so we used an activity schedule. Um, in order to teach the steps that are uh, associated with the high, with inspecting a beehive, which is um, a really complex task, um, I learned. Describe all the steps for me. But no, you don't, don't. You don't have to tell me them. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if I could even remember all of them, because it's really <laughs> crazy and complex. Um, There's smoke involved at some point, I oh, think, Oh, yeah, right? there, there is. Yep, you have to smoke the bees to keep them, like, chill and complacent so you can go through and inspect the hive. Yeah. Um, so uh, we created an, an activity schedule that consisted of a whiteboard, um, because it had to be really durable and, um, you know, kind of uh, hold up in rough conditions. And we took pictures of the um, participant completing the steps that are involved in, inspe in inspecting a beehive. Um, and we affixed them to the whiteboard with magnets um, and gave him um, a spot where he could cross off each frame within a hive as, as it was completed. And there's 10 frames in a hive. Mm -hmm. So we taught him to use his activity schedule. I mean, we did see an increase in the percentage of uh, steps that he completed accurately, but he didn't really meet, uh, meet mastery criterion for the hive as a whole. Okay. Um, and we noticed that he was having uh, trouble with the same steps every time. And the step is taking out a frame from the hive, looking on both sides and determining whether the queen bee is present or not, which is a really complex discrimination task because there's 30,000 bees in a hive. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's pretty tricky. So we were hoping to do some discrimination training procedures with him in an analog setting. Um, but uh, lesson learned, the beekeeping season comes to an end when it's 60 degrees or below. Oh. Yeah, so uh, we did a reversal design. We um, implemented the activity schedule after baseline um, and returned to baseline, but we weren't able to put that activity schedule back in. Okay. Um, so we're hoping to do that in the future um, next time he's back out in the fields. Yeah. yeah. That's that's such an interesting, I mean, did, did you find there were any ways you needed to sort of change your idea of how to do an activity schedule with such a complex task? Yeah, definitely. Um, we originally wanted to use an iPad, and then we brought the iPad out into the fields, um, and there's just like sunlight, and there's bees <laughs> everywhere. Um, 
literally everywhere, so you really can't see anything on an iPad screen. Um, and we wanted something, so when you're uh, beekeeping, you have huge like leather gloves on, so we needed something that was easy to manipulate. So mm -hmm. we used a really big whiteboard with magnets to cross off um, each frame as it was completed. So we had to get a little creative with you know what would hold up in those conditions. Excellent. So do you yeah. have any other, uh, you going to be looking at any other strange vocational sites in the future that you know of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, whenever someone has an interest in a particular area, um, you know, we're lucky that we collaborate with this agency that really likes to carve out jobs for people. Mm -hmm. So as long as, you know, people need to acquire some skills in a weird area, we'll definitely be into helping them do that. All right. And you have a backup career now, too, if, if uh, behavior analysis doesn't work out. Yeah. You do your beekeeper. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jessica, thanks so much for talking with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're here at Babbitt. We're talking to Karina Zelazogo about research related to successive matching to sample, which, Karina, you were describing kind of what, what, that, what that means a, a little bit. Yeah, so successive matching to sample um, in comparison to the standard matching to sample where you have the sample com uh, up here and then you have three comparisons. In the successive matching, you would have one sample, uh, the participant would do an observing response, and in that same position, only one comparison would appear. So the participant would respond to those two matches. But they would either respond or they wouldn't respond. So that's the successive part. Okay, and this is, so this this work was a follow-up you were, you were telling me to? Yeah, it's a follow-up from our previous research, and um, we, from previous research, we only got 13 out of 30. 32 participants uh, to demonstrate the equivalence classes and we just continue to change some of the parameters, some of the variables with adults and um, with the new changes we got 81% of the participants to okay. uh, do the equivalence classes. What do you think was the, the, the tweak that did it or was it just every tweak got a little bit closer? For the most part it was getting around the instructional control mm -hmm. so participants were fixated on some form of the instruction so um, for our line of, this line of research we just added the portion of use what you have learned so far and that was enough oh, okay. for them to like use what they have learned to figure out what the task was so it was about those little things so all right so this is this these participants were all adults yes these were college students oh college okay so yeah young adults right yeah, yes all right, and, and so there's some, some replication or extension going to be going on with the results? Um, yeah, so the next part the next part would be to uh, use this procedure with kids. Okay. And that's, that's the whole point of all this is to be able to um, come up with a procedure that's an alternative to the matching to sample to use with kids that have uh, developing disabilities. Okay, well I hope it goes uh, at least 80% or above uh, when you when you start it with the kids. I, I hope so too. Are you, are you thinking about their, the kids might give you a run for your money or any, any challenges? I think I'm going to have to do a lot of tweaking uh, <laughs> just to accommodate like the, the level of the task, all the things that need to be involved, so yeah, I'm prepared. Okay, good. Good to hear you're prepared. All right, Karina, thank you so much for your time. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we're here at Babbitt, and I'm talking to Laura Wilhelm about her research poster. So, Laura, tell me, what, what am I looking at here? Hello, thanks for coming over. Of course. So, I work with two-year-olds with autism, and a big focus of ours is play. Typically, developing kiddos pick up any object and pretend it's something else. They might pick up my phone and pretend it is a keyboard. It might be a hat, a variety of things, right? But our kiddos with autism don't do this. So my task was to teach them to engage in symbolic play. Mm -hmm. How I did that was we decided to teach three different dress-up play sequences, a gardener, a chef, and a firefighter. We used a in vivo model and most of least prompting to get um, their behavior to criteria mastery. We also used a matrix to determine what we would test and what we would teach. Mm -hmm. So we have a variety of different probe sessions that we ran. The first probe session we ran was what we called all materials. So all the materials we used in the gardener, the chef, and the firefighter dress up sequences were included. We did this because these kiddos are gonna go to preschool and at preschool there's gonna be dress up in the corner, a dress up center. And we wanna know how would they engage in play under those conditions. The second probe that we did was I mixed up the material across play sets. 
So each playset has topographically similar materials. In the gardener, there's a large circular planter, the chef, a large plate, and in the firefighter, a large steering wheel. Okay. So I might mix up and take out the steering wheel when they're pretending to be a firefighter and insert a plate and see if they would still pretend to drive the truck. Okay. And we found that they did. <laughs> you got to use something. You use, you use what you got in front of you. Absolutely. That's right. We also found that in the beginning, before teaching any of our play sequences, the children engaged in what we called indiscriminate play. Mm. That would be holding materials or engaging in stereotypy with the materials. Once we did teach them how to engage with these materials, we saw a lot more pretend play in our probe sessions. Excellent. All right. So good. So good results. So would you Absolutely. say this is something that would be uh, like replicable? Or are you looking to replicate it? Or you know other people who are exploring Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yes. I think play is a big topic right now, and so is generalization and matrix training, and so I think this falls right in line with the research currently. Great. Well, Laura, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. So I'm here talking with Jessica Gutflesh at the Babbitt Poster Session. Oh, you're a student poster finalist? Yeah. <laughs> it says so right there. Yeah, it does. Ah, uh -huh. so you did your work on category and choice with preference. Sure, yeah. It was, um, so basically what we did, um, there have been previous studies that have shown that children with autism prefer to have a choice over their reinforcers, um, but also that edibles tend to displace all other categories of items. They're the best, that's why. I agree. <laughs> um, so what we did is we took three categories of items. So we took edible items, leisure items, and social consequences, and we did a series of within category preference assessments in order to determine the hierarchy of preference within the category. So, you know, and then once we figure that out, we took the top three items from each category and combined them with the top three items from every other category. So you have your three uh, leisure items with your three edible items, edible and social, leisure and social. And what we found is that when we combined edibles with any other item, edibles were always more preferred than that item. Um, you can mm -hmm. see on my graphs, I know you can't see. Well, I can see, but no, well, one, yes. li no one listening. Right, but, uh, so once, um, and then when you combine, for one participant, when you combine leisure items with social consequences, the leisure items were far more preferred, and then in the other participant, the social consequences were more preferred, um, but then ultimately both of them, in both participants, were displaced by edible items. Mm -hmm. So then what we did is we did reinforcer assessments for the highest uh, preferred item in each category and a control to determine the reinforcement value of those items. Uh, for this participant, it showed that only edibles served as reinforcers, mm -hmm. which was interesting, uh, but probably due to the fact that he doesn't earn them typically throughout his day, so the uh. fact that they were highly preferred to begin with and then were relatively novel, there was sure. no sati satiation effect. Um, and then what we did is we did a choice preference assessment. So we did a pictorial paired, prefer paired item preference assessment. Sorry. Oh, you got have, you got props. I have props. So wow. Instead of this, just, this is why you're a poster finalist. You got props. <laughs> it's in, in 3D. Instead of having, um, so we we did uh, like the highest preferred item across, um, like from each category, then a choice of the three highest preferred items, um, and then uh, a control. Um, so this is what a just a single item would look like. It's three of the same items, so there's no control, or there's no choice, rather. Um, then this was like the highest preferred item from each category, and so the selection of this card would result in the, uh, you know, saying choose and pointing to the one that the participant wanted. Um, and what we found with that is that, um, so a choice among edibles was the highest preferred, then the highest preferred edible, and then the choice among the three highest preferred items from each category. But after edibles were removed from the situation, and then we saw that choice became more preferred. So despite the fact that um, leisure items were more preferred than social consequences, they would this participant still preferred to have a choice among social consequences before just receiving his highest preferred leisure item. And then we did reinforcer assessments. And uh, again, with the 
highest preferred item, which was an edible, mm -hmm. the, a choice among three items from the highest preferred category, and then from the second highest preferred category, which was leisure and a control. And again, only the ones that involved edibles were shown to have high reinforcement value. Okay. So is this something that you're going to be pursuing more research on? You sort of just... Did, did the did the research and, and you'll you know you'll see if someone else runs with it. I think there are a lot of different directions you could go. Um, I think that um, I think uh, like this. Our results demonstrate that choice is more preferred as items become like as preference decreases. So um, the choice becomes more valuable as you. Um, you know, when items are less preferred rather than, you know, just receiving your highest preferred item. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, Jessica, thanks so much for, for, for sharing all this information with us. And congratu congratulations on your well-received poster. Thank you. With your, with your 3D uh, props. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. So we're here at Babbitt talking to Dr. Pfeffer about her research on positive parent contact in, to enhance family school communication, which is a, a topic near and dear to my heart as well as, a, as a, also someone who works in public schools. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming by. Of course. Um, so the study I'm here talking to you about today is an applied school-based study in a public school here in Amherst. Um, and what we did is we attempted to design an intervention to increase communication between home and school, taking into account the behavioral concept of response efficiency. So the idea of having reinforcement far exceed demand so that we can actually get people to do things. High mm -hmm. reinforcement, low demand, that's how we in increase positive behavior. So what we did is we um, asked teachers first to indicate their preference for a variety of communication strategies. They rank ordered their top three. We provided those choices to parents to select their most preferred. Interestingly enough, all of the triads, parent, teacher, and student, yeah, parent, teacher, and student triads, selected email for this. That was a surprise to us. We didn't anticipate oh, that. Okay. Our, our matched preference assessment indicated everyone likes email. So as <laughs> It is you, very popular these is, days. exactly. And it's easy, and that was the whole goal, is we wanted something that was reinforcing not demanding. Mm -hmm. So as you can see from our data, um, our intervention approach was just adding two weekly communications from the teacher to the parent about an identified student with challenging behaviors in their classroom. So what our data show is we had some moderate effects on student behavior, both an increase in on-task behavior and a decrease in challenging behavior. Um, we had high variability in the data that we collected through classroom observations. Mm -hmm. So we also decided to, above and beyond visual analysis, calculate some effect size estimates. And those estimates, as well as our visual analysis, show moderate effects on on-task behavior for all four students in the study, and uh, moderate effects on challenging behavior for three out of the four students in the study. One student, as you can see here, Jordan, um, did not improve as a result, did not improve and challenging behavior as a result of the study. So we're particularly excited to be able to show that an intervention that did not involve the student at all mm -hmm. had an effect on the student's classroom behavior. One piece we're also very excited about is that despite the fact that we didn't ask teach, uh, parents to do anything at all, um, the emails were responded to by the parents for either, let's see, 33% through 88% of our um, participants, that's the range of the email responses. So that's showing that we created reciprocal channels of communication for kids with challenging behavior without asking the parents to do anything. So very low demand on teachers, mm -hmm. no demand on parents, and clearly there was some reinforcement at play because we increased that communication. So Excellent. That's about the gist of it. Good. So are you thinking of any, any steps for the replication, extension? Yes. Yeah, so we would like to replicate this study with a true multiple baseline design. This was a delayed multiple baseline just because of the context of public schools. We also ran out of time. This was happening for Brian in June, so oh. you can see there's only a few data points <laughs> Those there. Those June data points. We yeah. ran out of time with field trips and then you know, kids in oh, school. Oh, do they go to school at all in exactly. June anymore? It was hard to really observe during those challenging routines that we had identified. So 
um, we do plan to publish this. I'm hoping we can um, get it into our good behavioral journal. We're not sure where yet, and we would like to definitely replicate and continue to show that this works for other kids, not just these four. Well, typically on the show, we actually go over you know, journal journal entries. So you know, we, you may, maybe maybe we'll see this make a comeback Excellent. if we're doing Excellent. some work on uh, parent communication in the Wonderful. future. We all hope that it does. Well, Great. Th Dr. Fever, thanks so much for your Thank time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of the poster presenters, and especially thanks to the ones that had some time to talk to us. I'm sure more would have, but we just we just ran out of time. There were so many so many great posters and people yeah, to talk to. Yeah, it was really to. fun to do that. Yeah, it was. It was. It was good. We were kind of nervous. We're like, I don't want to go ask people. I don't want to. I don't want to bother anyone. You know, we have when we have guests on, it's easy because they're stuck at our house they or they're, they're stuck gonna, on the phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they know they're doing it ahead of time. But these poster presenters, we just walked up and said, "Hey, can we talk to you?" Uh, I really and wanted it was very to very generous with their time yeah. and excited to talk about their research. So we thank you guys. Yes, and I hope uh, for anyone if, if you're listening to this and we interviewed you, I hope we didn't seem. I did not. I did not come up and pull any like, oh, excuse me, I for maybe inside track. You need to talk to me. I think I said, I have a podcast on behavior analysis. Maybe you could talk to me. And some of them had heard of the show, which was really nice. But um, we don't want to be too big for our britches. But well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this Babbitt special, kind of a, a brief one. We'll be back to kind of our normal routine episodes next week. But we've all been gone for so many days now that we thought, hey, let's let's take advantage of the the scene because. Again, a lot of people couldn't get to Babbitt this year, and while conferences pop up everywhere, not all of you, I'm sure, can get to a conference. Hopefully, you can get to at least one this year, but you might not be able to get to any anytime soon. So just to kind of give you a little, little taste of that experience. Everyone, thanks so much for listening. As always, you can find us online as ABA Inside Track on Facebook and Twitter. You can email us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com or come to the website, abainsidetrack.com. Thank you so much, Diana, for Diana. not going to bed and talking to me about uh, your experience Good today. <laughs> we'll be back next week with our normal scheduled preview episode. But until then, keep responding. So long!